We have just done one through ten of the Ten Commandments. And we have uh, spent a, a bit of time with each of the things that God decided were the most important things to tell the people when He gathered them all on Mount Sinai and He wrote the Ten Commandments on the stone and gave them down to Moses and Moses carried them down to the people. This is the first draft. First draft, God picked out the rocks, sliced the rocks, and wrote with His own finger the Ten Commandments, the commandments of God, and that is recorded for us there in the book of Exodus. Gave them to Moses, and Moses carried them down to the people. And then, while he was there, he realized they were already breaking all ten. And he was so mad, he threw the stones down and he broke them. And so that's what happened to the original manuscripts with the finger of God. And the next time, Moses had to pick up rocks for himself. <laughs> and, uh, and so had to carry those rocks along and and so there's that was the <laughs> that was the uh, the kind of the consequence of him losing his stack there and and uh, blowing up at the people. Not that he didn't have a good reason, but uh, there is always a an expectation, always a consequence involved with anything like that. And so we looked at all ten commandments, and I want to zip over to a New Testament uh, verse today. We're going to zip into the New Testament before we continue our look into Exodus, because the idea of a commandment, the idea of the commandments is reflected all the way throughout the Bible, but it, it does come up again in the New Testament. And so, if you will find with me the book of Matthew, Matthew, the 22nd chapter, We're going to read this story about when people were questioning Jesus and trying to pin him down about the law, and we'll see what how Jesus responds. So let me set the scene a little bit for us. The 22nd chapter of Matthew is toward the end of the book of Matthew. We've got the beginning of the Gospels is usually stories about Jesus getting born, and then stories about Jesus getting baptized and starting his ministry and all the healings that go on and the teachings that go on, things start coming to a knot about three quarters of the way through any of the Gospels. They start coming up to, to a head and you, you see that Jesus is starting to be much more vocal and, and uh, public about running in against the powers that be. Because he knows as soon as he he meets them head on, then it's going to escalate to the point where he gets crucified. He knows all of this. He knows that he will be crucified. He told his disciples that. That I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to raise it, rise again on the third day. That's part of the plan. He knew the plan. And he was trying to he had explained this to them. And so as we get closer to the end of the books, we see Jesus getting uh, getting more pointed in his teaching and he may be ruffling feathers a little bit more. Okay? So, what happens here, the beginning of chapter 22, Jesus tells a parable. This is a parable we know as the parable of the wedding banquet where he says the story is a rich man is, is preparing a wedding banquet and in those days a wedding would be expected, you'd expect everybody in town to come. You would expect it to be just a big civic affair, especially for a rich man. Everybody's going to be there. It's going to be a big, huge get-together. It's going to be uh, an event to mark the social occasion uh, of the city. And if it's, a, if it's a community, a big area, a lot of people are going to be there. So a very important thing. And he tells this story about the rich man that, uh, that is going to have a wedding banquet and he invites some people, and some people say, no, thank you, I don't want to come. Now, when we read this, I want you to imagine the richest person you know invites you over to their house for a party. You're going to go. Okay? If, um, who was it? Uh, Bezos, Jeff Bezos. 
just set the rocket right over there uh, up in Fagans or uh, just did that? What if he had sent, sent everybody in here, would you like to come in and uh, take a walkthrough of my rocket before I send it up on space? Yeah, you know, that, we'd want to go see that. You know, Jeff Bezos, for all the money I have ever given to him on the internet, he doesn't really know who I am, right? <laughs> he doesn't. Uh, sure, they remember my wish list, but they don't really know who I am. Not like when God says, I know your name. I've got your name written on my hands. I've got your tears stored up in a bottle. They don't really know me. But this guy, this rich man, knew everybody in town. Everybody knew him. And he was inviting them to the banquet. And they said, no, I don't want to. <coughs> that makes him mad. And so he said, well, let's invite some other people. And then some people tried to crash the wedding. They tried to come in. And they didn't even have wedding clothes on. They weren't invited. And they weren't... Uh, expected to be there. They just thought they'd show up. And they were kicked out. They're not going to be there. And he closes this parable up with saying, many are invited, but few are chosen. Not everybody's going to get to go in. Now, the people that heard this knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. Are you saying that we, the pious Jews, are not going to be in the kingdom of heaven at the last time. Jesus, you know, that's exactly what I'm saying. You all get it, don't you? So, the people that show up into heaven are not going to be who we think on here, that we think they are. Okay. There may be more people there. There may be some people you expected to be there that aren't there. Because some people have the idea that they're Christian when they're actually not. They've never made that commitment to Jesus. They have never said, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want your sacrifice to cover my personal sins, everything I have personally done wrong. So I am taking a stand for you, Jesus. They never have said that. So that was his parable. And so now they are trying to rope him in. The different people that, that uh, kind of upset by this teaching are trying to trick Jesus into saying something so that they can get a sound bite and so they can turn the crowd against him because he's getting pretty popular. The first up, first up to that is the Pharisees. They take their pitch at Jesus in chapter, in, starting in verse 15. They say, oh, Pharisees with the Herodians. And uh, by the way, the Pharisees and the Herodians are working together. This is amazing. Because they hate each other. The Pharisees didn't like the people that supported Herod. These two political parties were much more against each other than our two political parties. Okay? And yet, they were working together to try to get rid of Jesus. And so, they came up to Jesus. They said, I know what we can get him with. The idea of taxes. Yeah, we can, we can get him to, to give us a sound bite on taxes and that will turn everybody against him. Because if he says, don't pay taxes, he's in trouble with Rome. And if he says, do pay taxes, he's against the, 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 the Old Testament law. We'll get him. So they said, Jesus, should we pay taxes? And he said, well, let's, uh, let's do this. Look at a coin. Whose picture is on it? Caesar's. Give it to Caesar. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give God what's God's. Oh, that's the best answer. That's the that answer didn't just wiggle out of the question. Didn't wiggle out of the question. He gave us the very basic principle for how we are supposed to relate to the world, to our government, to everybody around us. If it's government business, you give it to the government. If it's God's business, you give it to God. And that is the best advice for us today. So Pharisees, their, their pitch didn't, uh, didn't go. They missed. All right, next up, Sadducees. Sadducees come up against Jesus. And the way I explain this to, uh, to students is the Pharisees were all about being fair, you see. They're, they're always interested in doing, trying to make things right and in, in order and, and follow all the rules. They're interested in being very fair, you see. 
No. Next up is the Sadducees. Now, do you remember the Sadducees? Well, Sadducees, they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They didn't believe all the rest of it. They didn't take as authoritative all the other things, which included, like, stories about going to heaven. They didn't believe in heaven. Now, if we didn't believe in heaven, you know what we would be? Sad, you see. Okay? So here they are coming up to Jesus, and their pitch is, is uh, a hypothetical. All right, Jesus, so God gets married and uh, dies, and then his wife marries the, the next brother, and then he dies, and then there's the next brother, and he dies. Now this is, this is an Old Testament practice called the Leveret marriage, where you would raise up an heir for your brother's wife, with your brother's wife. And that's an Old Testament practice. And they went through, so the woman ended up with seven, hun son seven husbands when he died. So they say, in heaven, whose husband is she going to be? Uh, whose wife is she going to be? And Jesus is saying, you, know, you guys are coming to me with this question. You don't know anything about heaven. You don't even believe in heaven. You don't believe in the teaching of scriptures. So what is it that I'm going to be saying to you? So here it is. I'm going to tell you, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. And he answered them, you don't know anything about heaven at all. And in heaven, every person is going to be totally complete in their relationship with Jesus. By the way, it says we will be like angels. It does not say we will be angels. So don't let anybody fool you that people here, when we die, we become an angel in heaven. We don't. Angels are already created. There's not new angels being made all the time. And we don't become an angel. Okay? I know movies say that. Hollywood says that all the time. But it's, it's just a happy thought. It's not Bible. And we will be like the angels in that angels don't get married. Okay? Our relationship with Jesus is going to be all we will need. Okay? So that's, that's the Sadducees striking out. So next up, we have a group of Pharisees. Pharisees, they came together, and one of them asked an expert in the law. Who was an expert in the law? Now these people we call the scribes. They are experts in the law because that's their job. They write down the Bible. They, they see it because they don't have fax machines and copy machines and and they didn't even have printing presses. If you wanted a copy of the Bible, somebody had to write it out for you. So they wrote it by hand and copied it by hand. And so they knew it very well. That's what they did all the time is write the Bible. Write it out, copy it. And so they come up and they say, all right, an expert in the law. Maybe they're, maybe they're uh, going to try to find out some answers. No. They know all the answers. They think they know everything. See, these scribes, they think they know everything. And they came up to ask Jesus a question to test him. Oh, you're going to test God, are you? You're going to test Jesus? You think you know the Bible better than the one who wrote the Bible? I don't think so. So they come to him and they said, all right, Jesus, what is, what is the best commandment? What is the number one commandment? And so Jesus says, has an answer for them as well. Somewhere along the line, when the Bible was originally being written in the Old Testament, they liked round numbers. You ever notice that? The, the number of people that came out was like a group of thousands, and there was this many thousand, this many thousand, and, and so on like that. When you read the Kings, when you're reading them in the Old Testament, you see a lot of round numbers. Well, somewhere along the line, they started studying the law, I believe it happened in the captivity. And they got very interested in numbers. Okay? So, they're asking Jesus, what is the best commandment? And he goes into some numbers. You know, it's kind of an unfair question, isn't it? What is, what's the best commandment? There's a lot of commandments. Well, there's the top ten for one, and then there's some other ones there. How can you pick just one? Right, so... I'll tell you right now, if I like something, if I like a group of things, 
I have a hard time picking out what is my favorite, what's the best. Like, if you ask me what's my favorite movie, I couldn't tell you. Because I, I, I like movies. You'd have to narrow it down. Even if you say, what's your favorite Western movie? I'd have a hard time. Okay? What's your favorite John Wayne movie? Okay, well now I can maybe narrow it to ten. But, my goodness, you can't pick just one. People will ask me that too. They'll, they'll go, I'm a musician. What's your favorite song? Yeah, there's no way I could pick just one. Okay? What's your favorite song that so-and-so played? Well, okay, but then uh, if you name an artist or a, or a composer, I might be able to narrow it down to my favorite. But just my favorite song? can't do that. People ask me, you're a preacher, what, what's your favorite Bible verse? Oh my goodness. My favorite Bible verse? My answer is always the one that I'm studying for, for the next time I get to say something about God. So this week, if you had asked me, it would have been Matthew 22, 37. That would be my favorite Bible verse. Something I've been thinking about all week. Because whatever I'm into, that's my favorite right then. So if I had 10 kids, you say, who's your favorite kid? I shouldn't be able to pick one, right? Now, Joseph, he was the favorite out of 12. Uh, and you see, that kind of saw and started some problems, right? But we shouldn't pick favorite kids. I can't pick favorite Bible verse and so on like that. But they're asking Jesus, what is the best commandment? So they're going to test him. They're going to maybe start a little argument going on here. Well. Jewish scholars are still really consumed with numbers. They love numbers. They love counting things. They, they have a whole area of Jewish studies right now where, they will take, where they'll take a person's name and figure out a number that goes with that name. They do that. That's what they're, they're very interested in doing that. I have a, uh, a friend, actually the, the guy that fixed one of my guitars, uh, he was telling me all about the, some of the names of these political figures and what their numbers are. You know? okay. uh, but they're, con they're consumed or they're very interested in numbers. So listen, look at this. In the Ten Commandments, there are 613 characters in, in Hebrew. 613. Isn't that interesting? They counted them. All of the commandments in the whole Old Testament. 613. Isn't that amazing? The same number of commandments is the same as the number of letters in the Ten Commandments. As far as their medical science went then, they knew uh, 248 parts of the human body. There are positive commands, 248 positive commands. Of those 600 of the Bible, there's 240 positives. 365 days in the year, right? 365 negative commands in all of the Torah and all of the Old Testament. And how about this? 365 plus 248 is 613. Oh my goodness! Their their brains were just blowing up because they love counting things. Like the, like the guy on Sesame Street. I love to count things. Right? Remember the count in Sesame Street? They love counting things. So they were scribes, but they could be accountants because they just love counting things and, and adding things up and making sure that things are going to work out right. These are the kind of people that nowadays look at the Bible and try to find the secret code inside the Bible. There's no secret code in the Bible. The secret code is God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish. That's the secret code. It's simple as that. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Can we understand that? Can that make sense? You don't have to, to uh, get any kind of uh, cipher to try to figure that out. That is plain as day. God loves us, and we want to have faith in Him. But He was able to identify for the scribe the most important commandment. He said, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. What Jesus was doing there, he was quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, and I'll identify it for you there, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, which is the most famous memory verse in all, in all the, the little boys, the Jewish boys that have been studying the synagogue, this would be the most important memory verse that they would ever get, that they would start off with this. It was so important that the, the religious Jews would say this in the morning and in the evening. And when they wake up in the morning, they'd say it again and in the evening again. They'd say it morning and evening every single day. And uh, I always describe the, the way the Jews labeled and counted things, uh, kind of like Microsoft Word, where if you don't tell it the name of your document, it will name it whatever the first word is. Okay? So the word here is, hear, O Israel. The word in, in Hebrew for hear is Shema. So they call this the Shema, which is the word here. And they say that. Let me just read it to you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words I command you today shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So they would write these little Bible verses, and you've probably seen pictures of them that have a little box. People that have a little box tied to their head right there. Yeah, they have little boxes tied to their hands, and, and in that little box, they write, Here, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord is one. Shall love the Lord God of you. They would write that and put it in that box right up there. Write it and put it in that box on their hand. A phylactery, that's a fancy word there. They keep them in the box. The problem is if we put them in the box and it doesn't sink in, you know, if it doesn't go all the way into our skin and into our brain, it's not doing any good. We're just carrying a box around. But you're supposed to keep it right there in the front of your brain, right? We might say on the tip of our tongue. You know, these, it's supposed to be right there on the front of our brain. It's supposed to be in our hands. And the best thing about this is the way that it tells us to memorize them. It, the way it tells us to use them. The Bible is not to be simply something that, that we do on Sunday mornings. It's not, not to be just the Sabbath back then. Learning to love God, learning about God, it's supposed to be for one day of the week, all the days. Like when you get up in the morning, when you walk, and you're, when you're walking in the sun, when you go to work, when you're driving home, all of life. God's Word is for all of life. It is to be lived constantly. That's what the, that's what the impression that we get from reading that, that in Deuteronomy is. Deuteronomy is a, is a book that is very, very often quoted by Jesus. He loved quoting the book of Deuteronomy. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, Satan came at him three times. All three times, Jesus answered him verses of Scripture from Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is, is when Moses was kind of giving his last instructions to the children of Israel as they go into the promised land. Because he didn't get to go in it. Remember, he, didn't, he was not allowed to go into the promised land. So right before they go in, he's going to just lay it all out for them. Just tell them everything over and over again. Including the Ten Commandments. You know, they're in Exodus, but they're also in Deuteronomy. Why? Because everybody that heard them in Exodus is gone. They're buried in the desert. And the ones that get to go in are their kids. And so he's going to tell them again. And he's going to reiterate all these laws that, it, that is coming up. And he tells them this. It's going to be for all of life, you need to know this. And here's the most important thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul and with all your mind. He says, all of who you are needs to be in there. So let's think about this. How do we love God with all of our heart? We love God with all of our heart. And that, that comes up with the idea of our emotions. And sometimes going to church and worship can be very emotional. Sometimes going into your into a, a time of prayer at home can be just very, very emotional experience. We might cry, we might weep, we might laugh. Um, when we are in tune with God, we're going to love God with all of our heart, with all our emotions. Everything that's an emotion, we can turn it toward God. And when we turn our love as an emotion toward God, when we set our affection upon God, we can do things like seek the Lord where he may be found. Early, earnestly I seek you in a dry and weary place where there's no water, the psalmist says. We can seek the Lord and we can tune into God and love him with all of our heart. Doing so is going to help some of those other emotions, such as anger, envy, bitterness, love. When we're loving God, then the anger that we feel towards somebody else, that's going to go out the window. And when we're in tune with God and loving God, it's going to help us love our wives. It's going to help us love our kids. It's going to help us love our brother. When we're in tune with God, the anger and bitterness that we've carried around is going to go. When you are enjoying everything that God has given to you and you are just expressing your heart to God, you will not be able to covet and to, to lust after things of the world. It's going to go away because you're focusing your love toward God. Love is also, or the heart is also an indication, especially in those days, of, of how we would decide something. It would be a matter of, of your decisions, of your will. They would, they would know that the heart is where you, are, where you have made a, a, a decision to do something. To do something there. You're going you're to punch forward and, and act, okay? And so we have the word courageous. You know, courageous means to take heart. It has the word heart in there. So, uh, so we're going to make a decision, and that decision needs to be, I'm going to love the Lord God. I'm going to take a stand for Jesus, and I'm going to, to declare, Jesus, I love you, and I'm going to put you first in my life. So that willpower is going to be focused on God. That's what it means to love God with all of your heart. We also are told to love God with all our soul. Okay. Now, heart and soul. That puts every that puts our all of our decisions, that puts our, our willpower, that puts our affections and our emotions. And our soul has to do with the things that you really can't, you really can't uh, find on in a biology textbook. The parts of you that make you you that are just not on any of the anatomy and physiology charts. Like your, your character, your personality, okay? your background, your history. All the things that, that you would describe as you, that needs to be focused on God. Okay? So, in thinking of it this way, who you are is a soul. Your soul is immortal. Your physical body is mortal. It's wearing out. It's, it's losing energy every single day. It is, it is getting uh, one, you know, maybe another a couple of, of uh, radicals are going to be falling off and, and some, some of the things are going to be losing a bit of their function all the time. Hair starts falling out. Things start to hurt. Uh, when you get to when you get to a point that, where I have where you, you can wake up and because uh, you have slept wrong, you hurt yourself sleeping. Oh my goodness. 
That's an indication that physical body is wearing out. Our physical bodies are not going to last. Okay? Paul tells us they're going to be like a tent. They're going to fold up that tent and pack it in and we're going to go home. When we pack up this tent, then who we are, our soul, is going home. See? So our soul is immortal. It's going to last beyond the grave. Much longer than the physical body is. That part of who you are needs to be turned toward God in love. We need to love God with our soul. With all that we are. With 100% of who we are. And also, we love the Lord God with our mind. Love the Lord God with your mind. Can't I just be happy and, and love God? And why is it that I've got to like, read the Bible? Because we're supposed to love God with our mind. We're supposed to study God's Word. He tells us, study the Word. Read the Word. He says, memorize the Word. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. You know what that means? We're supposed to memorize it. We're supposed to think about it all the time. We're supposed to put it on our eyes and carry it with us as we go throughout the, the day. We're supposed to study to find ourselves approved, a workman that does not need to be ashamed. So we're supposed to be actively thinking about God and turning our brain power into energy spent toward God. Okay? Think about God. Use the brain that He has given you to think about some things that are beyond the physical. Right? What he says in Colossians is, set your mind on things above. We're supposed to tune our brains into something higher, something better. And that is loving the Lord God with all your mind. Okay? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But he didn't let the scribe off right here. He said, ah, but there's more to it. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, he quotes here from the book of Leviticus. He quotes Deuteronomy and Leviticus. He puts these two together. Love your neighbor as yourself. When he did so, he's saying that everything our relationship with God gives to us needs to affect our relationship with each other. Right? Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind is going to affect the way that you love your fellow man. Loving the Lord is going to help you love your wife. Loving the Lord is going to help you love your children. Loving the Lord is going to help you love the people that you work with. Even the people that are hard to love. When you love God, you'll be able to love them. Loving the Lord is going to help you love your neighbor. Even the neighbor that you don't want to talk to even if you kick your football into their backyard and you, you just forget about it because you don't want to go knock on their door. That kind of a neighbor. The kind of neighbor that Jesus is talking about, of course, we have that great parable that lets us know, yeah, it's everybody. Not just the next door person. It's the guy across the street, down the hall, around the world. It's all of our fellow man. You can only give that kind of love to your fellow man when your heart is right toward God. Okay? So, love the Lord your God, and that's going to affect the rest of the world, the way that you pour out God's love to your fellow man. You notice the Ten Commandments started with, with the relationship between man and God. No other gods before me. Honor God's name, honor God's day, but also... Make sure your, neighbors, your relationships with each other are correct. Don't lie, cheat, steal, commit adultery, all of those things. They're a reflection of our relationship with God. And so, Jesus puts these two together as the one greatest commandment. He said, on this, everything depends upon these two commandments. Get your relationship with God right. Get your relationship with each other correct. Now, Let's bottom line it here. There is, the, there is the Leviticus passage. There is a word that is in common 
with both of these passages that Jesus quoted. That's the word love. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Realize both of those have the word love in common. Curious thing about this word love. Nobody really knew it until the Bible comes along. Outside of the Bible, they just didn't use this word. And there's, there's not even much evidence that it ever existed until the Bible. Because this is a special kind of love. This is a love that gives everything that you've got for the benefit of somebody else. It's that Bible word we call agape. And that's the most common use, use the word, the most common word used for love in the Bible. It is the sacrifice of what I need to help somebody else. And it is the only kind of Christian love that is, uh, that is just unique to Christianity. It's the kind of love that Jesus showed us. God loved the world so much that he did everything. He paid the most expensive price in order to get you redeemed, in order to buy your soul into heaven. He gave everything that he had. Totally. A total commitment to you, to save you. He gave his very life to save you. He loved the world and he loved you so much that he did that. So our response doesn't need to be love the Lord your God with a little bit of your heart and some of your soul and maybe just a, a little smithering of your mind. No. It doesn't even need to be love the Lord your God with most of your heart, most of your soul, most of your mind, and most of your neighbors. No. All your heart, all your soul, all of your mind. Because when Jesus gave for you, he paid it all. He paid all he had to make you redeemed and fit for heaven. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much that, that uh, we just can't express it. We just don't want to honor you with our heart, with our soul, and our mind to reflect upon your goodness to us. Lord, if we have never told you before, we're telling you now, we love you. And if you have never, we've never made that initial commitment to say, Jesus, I want you as my Savior, then Lord, we would like to make that commitment now. And if there's someone here that has not made a, a fresh commitment to you to say, Lord, I love you, and I want to follow you with everything that I have, I pray that you would stir their hearts so that they respond to you in love as well. These things we're asking in your precious and holy name.